chapter 3. And after this, I'm going to invite Philip to come up and preach to us. It's Philippians chapter 3, uh, beginning at... No, it's not. Is it Philippians 3? Yes, it is. Philippians 3, beginning at verse 4. So it's page 1180 of the Bibles. Paul writes this. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. The other day I thought I'd seen God. I thought I'd been caught up in the rapture. I was driving through Chorley when there was a blinding light. I thought, crikey, it's the heavenly host. Then I realised it was, in fact, a speed camera. (laughs) I was doing 37 in a 30 zone. And so inevitably, a few days later, the letter came through. And it said, dear Mr North, you've got a choice. Either it's a great big whopping fine or three, and three points on your license, or it's a slightly smaller fine and you have to go to speed awareness course. Now, I'm going to test, I'm going to test the honesty of your church here. Hands up. <laughs> hands up who's been on one of these speed awareness courses. That is badly shameful. Okay, put your hands down. Hands up, who's just seen for the first time that a family member (laughs) has been on a speed awareness course? Anyway, I thought that is so badly shaming. You know, I'm meant to be a bishop. I'm meant to be a kind of moral example to the country. And here I am on a speed awareness course, having been nicked for speeding. So I created for myself what they call in the spy books a legend. I decided I was not going to be Philip North, I was going to be somebody else. I created a new identity for myself. I, on the morning of the speed school, I put on a check blue shirt and a pair of, pair of brown slacks, a pair of brown shoes. I thought, if anyone asks, I'm going to be Phil. <laughs> and Phil, Phil is a social worker from Blackpool. <laughs> Because there's nothing, no better way of killing the conversation than saying you're a social worker. So, Phil, a social worker from Blackpool, I practiced my lines. I'd worked out a branch of social work that I was going to specialise in. I arrived at this speed school. It was, it was in Oswald Twistle. I spent most, yeah, yeah, Mark's been there twice, actually. <laughs> I can't reveal your vicar's been to two speed schools. And the atmosphere, you go in, and it's just like, you know, when you're in detention in school. The atmosphere is exactly the same, the same silent, brooding atmosphere of shame and anger and resentment. And I sat down with this group of people and started chatting to a couple of people next to me, and uh, we were just talking on. I hadn't revealed my legend yet, (laughs) fortunately, because at that moment a voice came echoing round the room. Oh, Bishop Philip, it said. (laughs) Fancy seeing you here. It was rumbled. They'd worked out who I was. (laughs) Who are you, though, I wonder? Who are you? It's the question of the age. Who are you? When someone asks you that question, there's there's some very obvious answers you might give. I'm Philip. 
I'm a man. I'm an Arsenal fan. I've got two sisters. I've got uh, two nephews and two nieces. Um, I'd like to have a kitten, but I'm not in the house long enough. There's all sorts of obvious factual answers you might give to that question. Who are you? But who are you really? Who are you on the deepest level? What is your identity? What is your purpose? Why are you here? What is the point of you? Who are you? I think insofar as the culture we live in ever gets around to answer that question, they imagine that the human person is a bit like a blank canvas. Imagine you're starting a painting. You start with a blank canvas and then you apply colour to it. I think, lots of people think that's what human identity is. The human person is a blank canvas and then you can construct your own identity as you like just as you might paint a painting. Who you are is your own decision. Who you are is almost a consumer choice. You've got a lovely palette of colours, and you decide what identity you're going to paint for yourself on the blank canvas, which is you. So, one of those palettes of colour is your job and your wealth how much money you've got, how you identify yourself by your career, uh, where you live, the car you you work, you you, you drive, um, the, the objects you fill your life with. Those you choose for yourself, that's part of your identity. That's part of who you are, money and wealth. Another part of who you are, incredibly important today, is body image, what you look like. As you can see, I spent hours thinking about that myself. The days I spent deciding what to wear this morning, you would not believe. (laughs) But from ordinary people, you know, what you wear, how you cut your hair, how you make your face up, this is all part of your identity. And for some people, that becomes an absolute um, obsession. Uh, Zadie Smith, the novelist, said the other day, she's having to stop her daughter, who's seven years old, spending an hour and a half (laughs) in the bathroom making herself up. There's this thing called contouring. uh, Mark, I think, does this. Do you do contouring, Mark? You can see, look at that, look at this, look at that lovely face, look at that, yeah. (laughs) Where you spend forever ladling makeup on your face. People spend fortune on their clothes and their images and sort of millions of pounds on alligator skin handbags. You got one of those? Yeah. People spend a fortune on your body image. It's something you create for yourself. It's part of this identity. It's part of who you are, a colour on the palette. Another colour on the palette is our online identity. And it's extraordinary how on Twitter and on Facebook and on Snapchat, people are inventing identities for themselves. Um, and, and, you know, you create a persona for yourself. You carefully craft an image, how you want the world to be. And it's always fantastically happy, isn't it? Wow, just been to an amazing party. Just had a fantastic night out. What an amazing social life I've got. Everything's amazing. It's all construct. It's people inventing an identity for themselves. And then, of course, another way we create identity for ourselves is actually through our relationships. Tremendously important to us. But the people we choose to be with and the way we identify them, that's another colour on the palette. So the culture thinks the human person is a blank canvas on which you paint your own identity. Who you are is who you decide to be. You choose yourself. The trouble with all that, though, of course, is that it is very, very fragile and vulnerable. All of those things I just mentioned can quickly disappear. Wealth, things, jobs, they can all go like that. And, of course, the point with trying to uh, construct your identity around money is that enough is never enough. You always want more and more and more and more. If you try and instruct your identity around power... Well, Theresa May shows us how fragile that is this week. She's achieved her her goal. She's become prime minister, supposedly the most powerful woman in the country. All she's confronted with is her powerlessness and the limits of power. It's never enough. Body image. That's another incredibly fragile way to choose identity. I really worry about our young people, particularly, and not just girls, but boys as well now, who so desperately long to be like those models they see online or on the front of the magazines. They want that kind of perfection. But look at our bodies. You know, from the day we're born, we're aging. We're never going to be as perfect as we like. We're never going to have the perfect faces, the spotless expressions, the fabulous clothes, because we're ordinary, frail, broken human beings. You know, it just doesn't work. It's frail. It's fragile. You're never going to be the person you want to be if your identity is about your body image and how you look. 
even relationships. Relationships, of course, are tremendously important. They matter, they're precious, but they're fragile. And fast-changing human emotions and sickness and death can strip us of those relationships and no time at all. And what are we left with when all this is gone? We're left confronting the ultimate human fear that we are nothing, that all of this is pointless, that our lives have no purpose at all, that we're just randomly generated freaks of evolution, lives like that, and then we've gone. Who are you? I think as Christians, I don't think I know that as Christians, we would want to give a very robust answer to that question, who are you? You see, for us as Christians, our identity is not a construct. It's not something we have to make up for ourselves. We're set free from all of that. No, as Christians, our identity is gift. It's something that is given to us. Our identity is gift from God. And to discover your identity is to accept God into your life and try to live in his way. The Christian life is a process of uncovering that identity which God has given us. For us, identity is not construct, it's gift. Who we are is who we are in Christ. Who are you? You are Christ's. That's all we need to say. The chapter that we've listened to from Philippians chapter 3 is, is, is a wonderful example, really, of Paul giving his testimony and showing us how he uncovered that identity in Christ. He's playing a kind of, you know, who can be the best faithful person bingo at the beginning. He's having a go at those who want new Gentile Christians to adopt Jewish law and Jewish practice and in particular be circumcised. And he says, who do you think they are? I'm a much better Jew than them. And in fact, in chapter four, in verse four of that chapter, it starts with this wonderful description of Paul saying, look, here's my old identity. This is who St. Paul was before his conversion. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. That was Paul's identity. And it was a very strong identity indeed that he constructed for himself. That identity was all about obedience, compliance with the Jewish law. It was the law that identified who he was. And let's face it, he was brilliant at it. He was a Pharisee, the dominant sect of the day. And the Pharisees were men of tremendous learning who spent years and years and years studying the law, memorizing every verse of it. He was a hardcore, serious theologian who committed years of his life to study. He was so strong in his faith, so passionate about it, that he wasn't happy to accept those who believed differently, but persecuted them. That's how convinced he was in his faith. The persecutor of the Christians, a Hebrew, a zealot, pious for the law. This was a really strong identity. And just think what it ident- invested in that identity. But then this extraordinary verse, verse 7, whatever was to my profit, I now consider as loss for the sake of Christ. And he goes on to say, all of that was so much rubbish. Why? Because he's found Christ. He's found who he is, not in the law, but in Christ. He's discovered this new identity, an identity that is not construct, but which is gift. But how? You know, Paul was a respectable person. He would have been well known, probably quite wealthy, high status in the Jewish society of his day. He gives it all up. He's done all that learning, all that study, all those years learning, learning the language and learning the scriptures. He gives it all up. Why? How can he sacrifice everything for this new identity which he finds in Christ? How can he give it all up? What does he find in Jesus that he didn't find in the law? Three things. A new relationship, a new purpose, a new future. A new relationship a new purpose, a new future. 
The first thing he found in accepting this new identity in Christ was a new relationship. Remember in the very early years of the lottery, when it first started, there was tremendous focus on every single winner. You know, all the media would be hammering on the door, saying, what you can do with the money? And one of the first men to win a million pounds was about, was about 19, 20 years old. And all the press came to see him and said, come on, you're a millionaire now. What are you going to do with all this cash? And he said, well, it's very nice having all this money, but all I really want is a girlfriend. Never mind the money, it's the relationships that make sense of our lives. It's the relationships that matter to us. It's the relationships that are who we are. Now, Paul previously followed the law. Lots of do's, lots of don'ts, lots of commandments, lots of instructions, lots of massive detail, but no relationship. There's a dryness there, an aridity there. It's like just having to follow the school rules for no particular purpose or outcome, having to do what you're told. Where is the fulfillment? Where is the joy? Where is the purpose in that? But then, verse 8, Paul finds in Christ what the law cannot offer. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Knowing Christ Jesus, that's what he finds in Christ, a relationship which is the law un is unable to offer. That's what he finds in this new identity. It is founded on friendship with Jesus Christ. I remember discovering that in my own life. Do you know the reason why I started going to church? I started going to church for the money. When I was a boy, I was constantly, constantly in trouble. And my poor mother, bringing up three children on her own, desperately trying to manage this sort of ridiculous kid's behavior. One day, she's just stopped my pocket money. She said, right, no money at all until you learn how to behave. Well, I found a really brilliant way of getting my own back. It turned out that if you went and joined the local choir and sang in this choir, you got paid very serious amounts of hard cash for singing at weddings. And they had two, three, four weddings a day. You got to play football in between. And every single wedding you got paid for. Serious amounts of money. So I went along to this church because it was a very lucrative thing to do. And, you know, I remember, you know, working my way through this choir, thinking all this faith stuff that they preached about on Sunday was just a lot of tosh. How can anyone believe this nonsense, I thought? Well, then, when I was uh, in my late teenage years, 16, 17, a new priest came along, a new curate came to that parish, a man called Robert. And he showed me what it was to be a Christian. You see, until then, I thought that being a Christian was basically an intellectual activity. I thought it was about believing a certain set of sentences that we read in the creed. And I thought it was about behaving a certain way and being a good boy and pulling my socks up and, you know, doing all that stuff that teachers tell you to do. I thought it was just basically about being good. And he said, no, it isn't actually. Obviously, there's implications to the way you live your life. But the heart of the Christian faith is not about what goes on in your head. It's about what goes on in your heart. The heart of the Christian faith is relationship. Jesus died for you, and he's still alive, so you can be in contemporary friendship with him, he taught us. And that contemporary friendship is what unlocks all the other friendships in our lives. It's what makes sense of the other relationships. I know who people are because I know who Christ is. I know the preciousness of my friends because I know who Christ is. I know how to love my friends because I love him first. It is this friendship with Christ which unlocks everything else. The heart of the gospel is relationship. He taught me that, and that's what made sense of my life. That's what Paul discovers too. And that's what all of us can discover. At the heart of the gospel, the heart of what Jesus offers is not a moral code, it's relationship. And this relationship is not earned. You don't have to deserve it. That's what Paul thought. You had to tick up the righteousness points for obeying the commandments of the law. It's not earned. It's given as gift. Everything is gift. This love is gift. Jesus doesn't need to embrace you as his friend, but he did. Jesus didn't need to come and be born, taking on your form so you could share his divinity, but he did. Jesus didn't need to teach you the way of love, but he did. Jesus didn't need to give his life in agony upon the cross for you, but he did. 
Jesus didn't need to rise again, thus destroying death and opening the life of heaven, but he did. Jesus didn't need to go ahead to prepare a place for you at the Father's side, but he did. It's all grace. It's all gift. It's all relationship. That's what Paul discovers. That is the heart of the new identity we find in Christ. Friendship. It's about relationship. Contemporary relationship. So that's the first thing Paul found, a new relationship. The second thing he found in this extraordinary encounter he had with Christ, which he's referring to in Philippians 3, is a new purpose. Now, Paul, of course, had a strong purpose before, but it was a negative one, a zealot, a persecutor. His job was to persecute those who did not believe in the law in the way he did. That's what took him to Damascus, to this extraordinary encounter. Strong purpose. Standing up for the law, even if it meant destroying other people. He meets with Christ, and all that is changed. And in verse 10, he tells us his new purpose. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Becoming like him. That's his new purpose, to fashion his life on Christ, to live like Jesus. That meant, just as Jesus did, his task was to share the good news of the kingdom, to help others to encounter Christ in the way he had. That's why he went on these extraordinary journeys, incredible courage, going to completely random places, people who are pagans or worshipping trees or believing anything, to tell them about Jesus. Amazing courage. That's why he wrote so much of what he believed in his letters, so he could resource and support not just those churches he'd founded, but us also. That's why also he suffered so terribly, imprisoned, whipped, starved, locked up in prison. The stuff he went through, rejected by his friends, kicked out of towns, he went all through this because he knew his new purpose was to live like Christ, even to share in in his sufferings. What about you? What is your purpose? What is the center of your life? What wakes you up in the morning? Is it work? Is it the struggle for money? Is it having to get breakfast down, down the kids' necks before they go to school? What wakes you up in the morning? For a Christian, your purpose is Christ. It is to share his love, even if that can mean suffering. It's to spread the good news, even though that's not always easy. Last week, we kept in, in, in churches the Feast of St. Francis, a high liver, living a raucous, ra rackety life, who then found himself in a derelict church. And in this church, he saw a beautiful painted icon cross, a church called San Damiano. And he heard Christ speak to him, saying, rebuild my church. At first, he took that instruction literally, and he just simply rebuilt that church building. But he realized then Christ was calling him to do more than that, not just rebuild the church building, rebuild my church, call people back to relationship with Jesus Christ. He found his purpose, and it's your purpose too, rebuild my church, call people back to Christ. That's what you're for to share God's love with everyone, to call people to response. You know, what a marvelous gift is ours, to know Jesus as friend, to know the saving power of his love, to walk with him every single day, never to be alone, to know his strength, to be able to trust him even when life is hard. What a gift that is. What can stop us from sharing it? And of course, sharing it will be hard. It'll bring mockery, it'll bring abuse. Who knows what suffering it might bring, as it did for Paul. But as we share in that suffering, we're sharing in the suffering of Christ himself, knowing him more fully, knowing our purpose more deeply. A new relationship then, friendship with Jesus Christ. A new purpose to make Christ's love known and become like him. And finally, the last thing Paul found was a new future. Who knows what Paul thought his future was as he so arduously, ardently studied the law. He probably didn't have much idea. The Jewish law is very unclear about the future. Vague stuff about gloomy shale, but no assurance, no promises. Well, he meets with Christ, and then he finds his future. 
which is verse 14. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ. The heavenly prize. In Christ, Paul knows his future, a life centered on the cross. Paul knew that on the cross, Jesus took on his shoulders our death, our sin, all that is enmity with our human life, and that by dying, he destroyed those things forever. Paul knew that through faith and through his baptism, the power of the cross was made contemporary in his own life. So that Christ's death was his death. His death turned out to be not a thing in the future, but a thing in the past. Christ had died his death for him on Calvary so he could live forever. He knew that for certain. He knew that more surely than he knew anything else. The heavenly prize was awaiting him. For us too, we have a sure and certain hope in a sure and certain future. A lot of people today are like Paul was before he met with Christ. They have no idea what their future is. They fear the future. They think the future is pain or bankruptcy. They think the future is sickness or the annihilation of death. And if you live in fear of the future, that fear creeps its way back to fill your present with stress and with dread and with anxiety. Well, we know the future. We know that our future is to gaze upon the beautiful face of Jesus Christ and to gaze upon that face forever. We know our future is the joy, the beauty of heaven. We know that. And because we know that future in Christ, we can live today in hope and in confidence and in joy. There's nothing forlorn or pointless about the Christian life. We know where we're headed so we can live today in the sure, certain hope of that coming, the heavenly prize which is ours, which fills our presence with joy and with confidence. Paul then found a whole new identity in, in Christ, a new relationship, a new purpose, a new future. For us also, who we are is who we are in Christ. A few months ago, there was the newspapers tried to put in an expose, a, 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 a scoop about the Archbishop of Canterbury. It turned out that the person he thought was his dad was not his dad. Now, for many people, that would be a real shocking, terrible, terrifying news. It would strike at the heart of their identity. Imagine if you found out your dad was not your dad. You know, it's what the soap operas love, that kind of story, don't they? A revelation that someone's parent is not who they thought they were. And they thought that, you know, Justin Welby would be absolutely thrown by this revelation. He was absolutely calm about it. He said, well, that's all very interesting, he said, but it doesn't affect who I am. You see, I'm a Christian. I find my identity in Christ. Who I am is who I am in Christ. Justin Welby, Paul, the same journey. And it's the same journey that we're invited to walk on, to spurn the way of the world, which creates constructed identities from things that have no lasting meaning, to find our identity in Christ. Who you are is who you are in him. Shake off the social pressures to conform. Shake off the desperate need to, con make, you know, to turn yourself into something that you're not. Relax. Find who you are in Christ. In him, there is a new relationship, a friendship that lasts. In him, there is new purpose, being like him. In him, there is new future, the heavenly prize. Let's rejoice in that identity. Rejoice to be Christ's, for we are his and his forever. Amen. Let's invite uh, Mark and the band to come up. Let's be quiet for a minute.